hello and welcome to this panel discussion on optimising team software development. Uh, so I'm Leah Edwards and I'm a Senior Electronics Integration Engineer at Dyson in the UK, uh, where we use LabVIEW as one of our tools for testing new Dyson products. And the reason I wanted to run this panel is because I find it really interesting how teams work together in the real world. So this panel discussion will bring together members of different LabVIEW software development teams to share practical advice and real-world examples of what works for them. Um, we're going to explore how the teams arrived at their processes um, and also the factors that they um, considered when they're making decisions about their processes. Um, so the panel we have here today, they're from a range of backgrounds, including some engineering companies, which we don't always hear so much from at GDEFCON, as well as um, an alliance partner. So hopefully we'll get a range of different perspectives. Um, how this is going to work is once I've introduced the panel, um, I'll ask a number of questions. But actually, I'm not going to take any audience questions today just because 40 minutes goes by really, really fast. So if you do have questions and comments, please just put them in the chat and um, we'll take a look later. Um, right, so here with me today, uh, we'll go um, left to right. <laughs> Sorry, I had to think about that a second. Um, so we have Neil Pate, uh, who is the team lead for LabVIEW developers in the test and verification engineering department at Philips Innovation Engineering, um, which is the internal consultancy organization within Philips. Um, the global team provides LabVIEW expertise to all business across Philips and gets involved in everything from helping scientists to bug fix the LabVIEW code to the design and implementation of full turnkey automated test equipment for high-end medical systems. Um, next, we have um, Matt Colligan, Matthew Colligan, who is a lead engineer within the motor drives and advanced control department at Dyson. He primarily works on the development of automated test systems with a heavy emphasis on tool creation to take the weight off engineers to achieve their project requirements quickly. Um, Next, we have Paul Morris, who is the technical lead for software systems at Precision Acoustics Limited. The team are responsible for the development of ultrasound measurement systems and related control software used for either characterizing ultrasound devices, e.g. for medical equipment, or measuring things with ultrasound, such as in non-destructive testing. And finally, we have Chris Woodhams, who you've all met before, who is MD of Argenta. Uh, Chris is a mechanical engineer with an aerospace background who's been thrown into team management through the expansion of Argenta, al Argenta alongside um, his dad, who he works with. Um, Argenta are now a team of seven, um, a combination of project managers and engineers working typically on fixed price test rig solutions using NI hardware and software. Um, so the first question that I'm going to ask everyone today is um, I'd like you to elaborate on your biggest challenge in team software development and how you're trying to solve it. So we're going to yeah, pass some microphones around. Um, would you like to go first, Chris? Sure, sure. Um, so I think one of the big challenges that we face is um, sort of avoiding a single point of failure. And what I mean by that is... Um, having one person that's working on a project. So the problem that can cause us is that people go on holiday. Oh, <laughs> shock. Yeah. And um, potentially during their holiday, the holiday, the, the customer that they've been working with um, requires something. And um, we can't just leave them hanging until they get back from holiday. Um, so trying to sort of ensure that we've got two people at least working on projects. Um, and that obviously comes along with its chal it challenges as well. So. You, you can think about cost, you can think about time, you can think about skills. Um, all of those things need to be managed in ensuring that you have both of those people capable of being able to respond to those challenges that come up during those periods. So I think that's something that we um, have struggled with and sort of started to resolve through um, the way that we structure our teams. So we typically have a lead engineer and a developer. Um, so typically the lead engineer is the kind of subject matter expert, if you like, and the developers doing the development. Um, it doesn't always work as strictly as that, but typically that gives us that cover. 
um, or knowledge for the project so that it's not a single point. Sure, and do you, with the two people, um, if one's the uh, the lead developer and the other, um, do they tend to both take the opposite roles for I like either project that they're working on, or do you tend to sort of go around the circle and get yeah. everyone involved? So we probably got um, we got a total of five engineers, um, and currently we probably had four of those that have led projects and mm. but they've also done development so yeah it does it can flip the, the role can flip and sometimes people that are quite experienced quite enjoy taking on that developer role mm. um, and it also gives people the opportunity to, to go into that lead role um, to develop those skills in leadership and all sorts of other bits and pieces as well so yeah, oh, a bit great. Of a combination. yeah thanks so much for telling us about that uh, so next uh, Paul what's your biggest challenge the people yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think, uh, I mean, that is a, always a challenge in team development, but it, it's probably one we all know about. I think what I was going to talk about is actually about roles of people, I think, because uh, it's something that we've sort of changed quite a lot in the last year. Um, for a long time, I was the team manager and the team technical lead and customer service and everything. Um, and that's hard to lead a team in that position because mm. you're always, how do you get the team working while you're also trying to do problem solving? So. Uh, I now have a manager, and it's great. Um, <laughs> so I think identifying where you're good at things, right? So I'm not great at the team management thing. Um, so having someone who's been able to come in and uh, take that role over and deal with the day-to-day -day, um, management, admin tasks, sorting out who's doing what, uh, and leaving me to focus on like the technical solutions and, and play, um, <laughs> which is far more in keeping with my role. Um, that's really good. So I think the idea of just putting the right people in the right places. We, we can still move around and do different parts of the job. No one's like in a, in a box that they can't leave. But I think the idea that you just start to think more about who does which bits has been mm. really, really beneficial. Yeah, it's great to hear because I, I feel like quite often it's expected that you just become a people manager eventually. So it's great to Never. hear that yeah, <laughs> a lot of us, like we, we came into this for a reason, right? So yeah, I'm glad to hear that y you guys are thinking about that. Great. Uh, right, Matt, how about you? What's your, your biggest challenge? Um, so I definitely think it's you put a lot of effort and work into um, making your workflows and processes with your local team optimal. But when you're talking about teams that stretch multiple countries and time zones, it's trying to bridge that gap so you're having more of a personal experience and making space for the, the, the offshore um, developers in your team to feel respect and feel like they're giving their their input into what you're doing instead of just telling them this is working for us um, you should be putting it in as well maybe maybe there's something different there and you just want to try and make them feel um, part of the team while also not av having that in-person experience can be can be a challenge yeah, yeah I bet because um, I guess is it like Singapore and Malaysia yeah, that exactly. you're working a lot with yeah so there's that like few hours window where you get to talk to them. Yeah, that must be, yeah, I've had experience of that as well. Yeah, great. Um, so, um, uh, Neil, how about you? Uh, yeah, <coughs> Excuse me. I, I kind of agree with what everybody said, but maybe I was also going to say people and like trying to herd developers like herding cats and things <laughs> like that. But I guess the one thing we haven't touched on is LV merge, right? I guess actually, you know, as your team gets bigger and your code base gets bigger, if you bring people in and people start to step on each other's code, uh, and it, it can be a mess, right? Unless mm. you have proper structures in place or kind of agreements that, okay, this bit of code is, is mine for today and tomorrow you get to mess with it so that we don't have to try and do like crazy git merges and things like that, which which no one really wants to deal with. So that's actually kind of a, and, and obviously that as the team size goes up, that just, just gets bigger and bigger if you haven't actually addressed it uh, with formal processes, I guess. Um, sure, because so are you guys working across um, different countries as well? Yeah, we, we do, but we, again, we try and partition the work sensibly. So like, um, if you break a project down, then you, okay, I own this kind of component, this subsystem, and uh, someone mm -hmm. else shouldn't need to go and start to mess with it, because if, if they do, they're probably going to break something. Sure. Um, so it's like communication and, and those kind of things are... are it, it it's, can be a challenge sometimes. I bet. So how do you choose to define that then? Is it all in messages or do you have like a, a, a way that you say, right, this code is mine today? 
Yeah, I think so. As being a bit glib about today, I guess like the the bit that you're working on is 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 probably yours for the duration of the project. So if you've done the GUI, though, then it's probably you're the guy who gets to fix the GUI bugs for the rest of time, or the particular <laughs> the particular instrument. You know, like like certainly you don't want to go uh, more granular than a, like an LV class or something. You don't want two people tinkering with the same class, probably, or like of a library. Yeah. Sometimes even the LV project, right? It just randomly won't won't merge if you save things. Yeah. So, um, don't want to <coughs> I guess it's just XML surgery, right? Oh, <laughs> bad memory. <laughs> yeah, I think we can all relate to that. Uh, thanks. <laughs> right. Um, let's move on to the next question. Um, so this is something that I think is coming up in the next um, session, so maybe we don't want to step on it too much, but I know that many developers are attached to their own particular style. So um, within your teams, do you enforce style? And what best practices have you found to be effective? Right. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll take this one. Sure. Um, um, so I, I guess I'm like a... A style Nazi by <laughs> just just n by nature, and that's something I have to absolutely fight when working in a team environment. Like nobody really wants to be told you've got two bends too many in your wire there or something. That's just not something that that's constructive for, for things like that. So I think it's super important to have a generally accepted style, um, but you can't get too hung up about, about little things. Mm -hmm. Like it's actually kind of funny. I'm I'm recently looking into some Python and Rust. And they're new to me, so I'm just relying on the, the auto format is built into languages, and it's actually liberating not to need to worry about that kind of thing. I just hit Control S, uh, VS Code formats it maybe in a way I wouldn't I wouldn't think is natural, but you get used to it. Um, and I think as seasoned lab developers, we've we've acquired style over time, and it's very hard when someone comes and says actually that's not your right style. But mm. maybe if you came into it from day zero and just used block diagram cleanup. You, you wouldn't actually have have such an opinion on things, so mm -hmm. I think um, as a team, it's important to have a general style, but not to get too hung up over over little things. Sure. Yeah. Can I, I just say, yeah, maybe encourage as opposed to enforce <laughs> the style <laughs> yeah. is probably a better way to approach it, right? But yeah. Sure. Yeah. Do you have something on this, Chris? Yeah, I think um, it's one of the most important things is having an environment where people are, are okay with. Um, taking on constructive criticism. So mm. if um, somebody's looking at some code and they find something that doesn't quite align with what the team would deem to be the style, um, a conversation can be had about it. And if we, there's an agreement that we change it, then we change it. If we don't, then we, we leave it. So I think that's probably quite an important thing to ensure that that's something that's really encouraged um, and not sort of harshly criticised and all those kinds of things. So. Yeah. Sounds quite democratic, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm trying, right? Yeah. <laughs> Great. <laughs> right. Um, next question. Um, so the question is: Do you take a light or heavy approach to software development processes? So what I mean by this is: Do you try and sort of codify everything, have it written down, or do you just um, do, do you try and let people take their initiative wherever possible and just agree on the minimum? Um, so then coming from this, how do you balance the need for agility and flexibility with the need for this structure and consistency? Any thoughts on this one? <laughs> um, we, we got um, an ISO 9001 process in place, um, which sort of supports a lot of the way that we do things. Um, but I was very conscious of it not being restrictive and ensuring that there was some flexibility in there. Um, and I, I think we've got a good balance with that now. Um, mm -hmm. And the the key, I think, that we've found is that the design stage is really critical to sort of set that level, to set that flexibility um, with, with the client as well as with the sort of software development, if that makes sense. So we're obviously super um, sort of keen to sort of lock stuff down at a certain point in the project with the customer so that we're clear on scope and anything, any change management can be easily discussed because we've got a document that says what we're going to do. Um, and then in terms of flexibility on the software, that sort of develops over time, I think, in when you're putting the software requirements together, um, making sure that we're aware of the fact that we are doing this fixed price. So mm. we've got to be careful about how we go about defining those things. So um, trying to get a balance, but it's definitely not easy. Yeah, <laughs> definitely great. 
Uh, would you like to answer that? Uh, yeah, because I can. I guess I can come from the other perspective of not having those. Um, like clients and specking things like that, and I think it is very much dependent on the project that we're working on that whether um, time is often something that's quite the limiting factor. And you can certainly have uh, like a ground level expectation of the development processes, um, but I think it's key to open it up and. Um, those new engineers coming in might come with a fresh take and maybe the new industry standard is something that I'm not aware of yet. Um, and, and teach me, exactly. Oh, great. <laughs> great point. I do think it's important, though, to maintain consistency. Like, I believe software development is, a, is like almost an, an art and a craft more than, than a science and such that I don't think you can write down how to make great software necessarily. Um, so you really need to give individual developers the freedom to to be themselves. But you need guidelines, right? Like, I mean, I'm, I've seen software recently which use literally every communication mechanism possible in LabVIEW. <laughs> um, and it, it worked. LabVIEW, LabVIEW is happy and the end customer doesn't realize. Um, but but that's not great for a code base over its, its lifetime, right? So And a, as, a, as a lead, it's your responsibility to sometimes say no to people. Like, okay, that's cool. I like that, but not in this project. Like this is unfortunately the style that was picked ten years ago, and there's nothing fundamentally wrong with it. Uh, so for the perhaps for the rest of the life of this piece of software, we're going to stick to LV2s for data communications in this thing, just just because we need to m maintain consistency, and let's think about changing it in the next greenfield type thing, if it ever happens. Sure. Yeah, I suppose that's the power of software. Like you can always change it compared to when you have to wait you know, six weeks for hardware and that. Yeah, that, that's great to hear. Do you have an answer, please? Yeah, I think it's probably just worth touching on the other side of the processes, some of the more software engineering processes that people talk about, you know, mm. unit testing things. And, and <coughs> I hope you're not recording this and that Fab never sees <laughs> it. Um, <laughs> we, we used to have a very nice process that Fab helped us to develop. Uh, we don't do as much of it as I think we should. But I think there's definitely um, there's a balance in there as well that's got to be found. I think you know we're always balancing different things because you can make some of those processes far too heavy. Mm. Uh, and I think we approached that with Fab trying to make it not heavy. It's still too heavy for me. <laughs> sure. A bit process averse uh, personally. But um, but yeah, I think you know uh, those are the other sides of the processes that we should be thinking about because. Um, you know, it's managing your team as part of the team development, right? If you've got some nice processes for how you verify someone else's code, it gives the rest of the team uh, more confidence in what's going on, and it's just, uh, they're really useful things to have. It's just figuring out how and when and where with the minimum impact on productivity, I guess. Great. So, yeah, it sounds like for a lot of you, the time constraint is what makes you want to constrain certain things, but then depending on how much that's affecting things, you sort of balance it. It's great to hear. Right, um, next question. How can you, this is sort of related, I think. How can you balance the need for innovation and creativity with the need for meeting project requirements and deadlines? So quite similar, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I'll start off. Um, I was, this is something I'm really, really passionate about um, because I think the best way of achieving project requirements and deadlines, especially in like, the industry I am, is having engineers who are passionate about it and are having fun. This is why we're here, right? We're, we're doing Navview because we enjoy it. Um, and it's having that ethos of having people comfortable with saying, um, what if we did this? Or I wonder if we could try this out? Or um, And things like that. And take a break. If you're hitting your head against a wall of a, a project and it's not time critical, go ahead and try and do this scripting application that can save some people time and things like that. Sure, that leads me to maybe being saying that I, w I don't want to do this two hour task, so I'll, I'll spend days to innovate a scripting tool. <laughs> Definitely done that a few times. Um, but I think it's opened up a lot of um, really great tools and architectures within Dyson. Mm. Um, and some of the best things have come out of things that someone has thought up of a pain point that um, one of us has just kind of accepted um, and we're stuck in our ways, really. Um, I guess that's not always the case or able to be done, especially when you're in like a consultancy where it's time and you're doing a job for someone and things like that. Um, but I think it's really something that you should encourage and especially open that space for people 
to feel like they should try and do something new. Oh, great. Yeah. Maybe, maybe one thing to try is to extend the deadline from the beginning. Yeah. Um, I've had a couple of conversations with people who, uh, it's strange how customers seem more and more willing to accept longer times for stuff. So mm -hmm. don't necessarily push to give them the best, you know, most uh, optimistic deadline. Like, we'll have this project finished by the end of next week. Oh, make it the end of next year. I don't know. Just <laughs> push, it, push, push from the beginning. You know, give yourself space to have the space for innov innovation and creativity. Because the creativity, like Neil was saying earlier, you know, software development is, is creative. It is an art uh, on many levels. So yeah, you need space for that. So it's really easy to fall into the trap of going, yeah, no, this is easy. We can do this in, in no time. Uh, and then you realize that if you want to do it right, you can't. Um, but then you've already kind of given the customer one timeline, and now you need to move it. That's much harder than just saying up front, mm. well, you know, give yourself the space. Yeah, Not I've, an easy thing to do. I've definitely felt that, like, I at least, like, times 1.5 or double my estimates normally because there's always that thing that you didn't think about. And then if you want to try something new, there's just not time, is there? So, yeah, great to hear you think about that. I think yeah, I agree with all that stuff that's been said. Um, I think one of the additional things that we consider is uh, like KPIs and mm. kind of measures of performance on projects and trying to make those uh, things, that things that we discussed that aren't like, oh my God, you're not meeting it. It's like, how can we sort of collaboratively get there? Because we all want to achieve it, right? We all want to make those projects successful. We all want to hit those targets. So it's trying to bring those up regularly. Um, so we sort of try and encourage the uh, project manager to keep those on people's minds during the weekly catch-ups um, so that it's kind of constantly being talked about. And I think the other thing we try and do with the creativity side is have, we do FedEx days. So mm. we try and have like a day every eight weeks or so where people don't do anything to do with projects. They just do something completely off piste. So not like baking a cake or anything like that, but you know, <laughs> we, something software related. But um, that's a really good way of giving people the opportunity to sort of get that flowing. So. Oh, that sounds great. I suppose it stops you being completely stuck in your project, and when it's not going fit that well, it, it can feel horrible, can't it? So just a glimmer yeah. of hope, I yeah, guess. Yeah, and it can transition into stuff that becomes valuable, like, like Matt said. Mm. You, you can then have something that actually has an impact on how you deliver projects. Oh, great. Just one thing to add is sometimes it's interesting to sit on both sides of the table. So I was a freelance consultant for 10 or 12 years, and then it's your money. Right, so you get to to, to balance, like as a as a salaried employee, you know, well you get your salary every month, you know, and and it's, it doesn't come into it sometimes. But the moment all of a sudden, if you can work smarter, you get more money for less work, or if you screw around, you get less kind of thing. And that's interesting when you have this internal balance of do I invest time in my, I want to try this new thing, but I know the first project's going to be a bit slower, I'm going to lose a bit of money, but I it's cool anyway. And that's 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 when it gets interesting, as you see, and you naturally do what you want to do, what you prefer to do anyway. I mm. think I think often you most engineers would slowly iterate the way they work, um, probably erring on the side of creativity. I think as a as a freelancer, uh, I'm, I'm guessing from my data set of one. So, <laughs> oh great, yeah, good to hear different perspectives. Right, next question. If you have many decentralized teams in a company that use LabVIEW, so I realize this doesn't necessarily apply to everyone, uh, what strategies do you have to avoid duplication of effort? And what do you choose to share between teams and why? Does anyone have this experience? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, so at, at Philips, we have um, teams across the globe. We've got um, engineering hubs in, in India, in the US, and in, in the Netherlands. Um, but I, I guess with LabVIEW, typically, there's still the teams are quite small. Like um, mm. you, um, it's not, I, I've never seen more than a, hand, a small handful of, not even a handful, a couple of fingers of people, LabVIEW developers working on the same thing just because it just becomes unmanageable given mm. how difficult LabVIEW is to work with or historically was b before we had, you know, proper merging things and, and get. So I'm um, kind of touching on what I spoke on earlier. If, if you partition the project sensibly and okay, that bit's your bit and that bit's my bit. And if you work to an interface, it doesn't have to be formal, just at least some kind of agreement in your head that this is where we're going to meet, then actually it, it almost sometimes figures itself out. Like, sure. um, like you wouldn't want to both be working on the same instrument driver, for example. I, I think that would just always be problematic. 
mm. or, or both trying to change the GUI at the same time. So is it small enough then that you'd never get two Lavi people who don't know each other who'd go away, get the same hardware and develop the same driver? Because that's yeah, not, something not, I've not for us. You're so the projects <laughs> are so personal anyway. Like you, mm. you've, you have stand ups or even if you're completely remote, you're on teams like messaging multiple times a day about stuff. So you typically always know what your colleagues are working on if okay. they're working on the same project. So all the LabVIEW people then must be very connected to each other. They I are guess. on a project. Yeah. I mean, where the duplication, uh, at least within Philips, is a problem is we've got like 20 different frameworks just over time. <laughs> like a company, a business in location A will have developed their own automation framework using technology A. And a different team who don't know about that team have done the same thing and effectively wasted time doing it a different way that's completely incompatible. Like you literally cannot reuse anything. Like um, although they do exactly the same thing in principle, uh, it's just wasted effort. Um, mm. And that's just like historical. So what we're trying to do is introduce sort of a, a global framework that allows us to give to teams to say, okay, this is the one, the one way to rule them all kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. um, but that has its own challenges as well, yeah. right? Because we heard Kabil speak about that the other day. Um, so great to hear. Um, anyone else got anything on this one, Matt? Uh, yeah, I guess um, it's, as you know, the, we have a lot of teams and we have that scenario that you mentioned that um, <laughs> it's a lot better now, um, but people didn't often communicate team to team of what tools they've developed and what challenges they've overcome. Um, so when we got in our internal user group, we often presented me overcoming a challenge, for example, and three other teams would say, oh, we've done that as well. <laughs> um, and I'm glad I spent months doing that. Um, so it's, it's very much just communication, I guess, and just meeting up and kind of touching on your last question of everyone's very precious of their code and it's trying to have that open mind of not my code's not better than your code. It's um, mm. how can we best distribute that, I guess, um, and following those standardized processes that we mentioned. Um, Great. Yeah. <laughs> Good to hear. Right, um, so you got 15 minutes left. I'll try one more quick. Um, do you, well, yeah, one more before the final question. Uh, do you encourage LabVIEW developers to learn a second programming language? Um, if so, what led you to that decision? And have you seen any benefits? Um, yeah, we, we do um, web development as well as LabVIEW. Yeah. So we, we've got... Um, We've been doing that since since the business started in 2003. So we've got a lot of experience with um, C Sharp um, and developing sort of web technologies as well. Um, so that probably answers the question pretty quickly, actually. Yeah. So, <laughs> so has them learning web development helped their LabVIEW at all, do you think? Or is it just too separate? I think it's quite separate. It kind of helps with trying to assess the right tool for the job. I think that helps, mm. like having that knowledge. Um, I'm not sure how translatable the, the learning is from one language to another. Um, I think it is a really good skill to develop because obviously people um, in our team typically teach other people as well. So mm. people that have got a lot of experience in C Sharp will teach people who haven't got so much experience. So those skills are really key to develop to enable that knowledge to be transferred. Um, so that's a real important one and quite a challenge sometimes as well. Oh, great. So it's sort of not transferring skills for LabVIEW, but transferring teaching skills. Yeah, yeah, there can oh. be that as well, yeah. That's yeah. great. Right. Uh, I have a <coughs> slightly more sinister take on that. I, I do also encourage developers. Um, and recently, uh, a junior engineer who like really wanted to go full in with LabVIEW, I'm like, yeah, maybe you want to also learn something else. Like um, you've got 40 years of your career ahead of you. Mm. you know, <laughs> if, if, if you're going to make a big bet now, Maybe maybe don't go all in with with one thing. So like like Python mm -hmm. or Rust, like d you won't go too wrong with spending a bit of your time learning those things. Um, but I find that the best developers want to do this anyway, right? You don't really mm -hmm. need to encourage them. They're like, well, I, guess what I did on the weekend. <laughs> 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 you know, like uh, and that, that's that's cool. Those are the uh, I find you know, really fun teammates to have. You know, the ones mm -hmm. who, who are just doing this on their own um, and don't need to be pushed or encouraged. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think at the moment, you know, some of the discussions this week <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, make this quite a relevant question. I mean, it's something we've been talking about in the team. I've got uh, three new members who have only been with us for a year, or well, two for a year, one's only a couple of months. And, you know, it's the difficulty I have is we have nothing else already. So we only have LabVIEW. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. So for me as a technical lead, it's really difficult to let someone else do something in a different language when I'm not going to be able to look at it and know if it's any good. <laughs> um, so, but at the same time, I think it should definitely be encouraged. And uh, yeah, and again, there's a time question. Uh, I'd love to do it the weekend. My wife and kids might not agree. Um, <laughs> but, you know, um, yeah, how do you find the time? You've got customer projects in lab for you to finish. Where do you find the time to, to do it? But, yeah, I think it's yeah. definitely worth looking at um, and then trying to figure out you know, which way do you actually go mm. because I don't know anything about the other languages. <laughs> so mm. which one do I look at? Yeah. So there's a lot of things in there that I think it's definitely worth thinking about. Great. Right. Um, I see we've got 10 minutes left, so I'll move to our final question. Um, so describe a change to team processes or practices which brought a large benefit for your team. I'll go first because I sure. already answered it. I took yeah. myself away from the management position. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, and that's been huge, right? Because, mm. yeah, it's really freed up the team. So I've, I've already answered twice. Awesome. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I, I guess... Um, for me, the big one was uh, introducing like more professional DevOps type type practices. So at, um, I actually took a break from LabVIEW a few years ago and moved into Unity and C Sharp. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was a team lead for a team of about four or five devs and, and things like that. And um, no one else was doing any kind of testing, you know, mm -hmm. unit tests or formal tests. We had, a, we had a build server. We had Bob the builder who was sitting in a corner somewhere. And some teams were using it. Um, but we kind of decided as a team, well, let, let's try this. And we, and we went from zero tests to a year later, something like 500 to 1,000 tests. Oh, wow. And, <laughs> and uh, the, with the CI setups that you, on, on push, you would, you would get like a, a pop-up sometime later. Uh, the build server got quite busy at one point, so it might be an hour or two later, but <laughs> notifications of whether all your tests passed or not. And mm. once we had those tests in place, like the number of regression errors that we were making just almost dropped to zero. It was just just fantastic. Like um, every single team member was like, "Okay, this is super cool." The the time we invested and we had to do some ugly stuff in C sharp with reflection because we hadn't made the code in a way that was testable. Mm. So we had to like hook into some classes from you know like really take a few shortcuts. But the the benefit was absolutely outweighed the the fact that we felt dirty about ourselves for doing that. Um, and and then coupled to that is is the second benefit was the rule we kind of made in the team was. When you find a bug, in either in production or during testing, is you're not allowed to fix it until you've written a failing test. Like, like just go and write the unit test that then fails, yeah. and then you're allowed to fix the bug. And because you've got it, and that's just like it takes like a couple of times people to, to get this, mm. but if you can get that as a as a habit, it's just super powerful. Um, but you need to practice it. Like I find it was a rule I made for myself, and I, st I still break it. I'm like, ah, oh, Neil, you're fixing it. <laughs> Stop fixing it. Put it down. Go write the failing unit test. Mm. And then, and then you can fix the code, and then your your test goes green, and, and you feel great about yourself. So, um, great for for me, it was introducing tests to the team and, and being part of a team that actually cared about testing, mm. um, just just made life much smoother. Fab. I think I think for us it was um, the ISO nine thousand one stuff, um, mm. sort of going f through our process from, from scratch. Um, it was pretty painful, and it probably took sort of twelve to fifteen months to to do. Um, but it just meant that we had that consistency that we've already talked about a little bit, um, mm. like the consistency in the way that we do things um, and the consistency in the way that we sort of approach different aspects of, of projects. Um, and it, it was painful because it, it's change and it's people and people don't mm. typically like that. <laughs> yeah. um, so it was trying to engage people to get on board with it and get behind it. And, it, and it's, it's, everybody is now, but probably a year, year ago or so, it was, there was lots of questions. And I think some mm. of that came from, from me, really. And, and I was being a bit cynical about it and sort of talking about it in terms of being red tape and all that kind of stuff. And sort of changing my mentality and the way I talked about it really helped to support the fact that everybody else should be looking at it like that as well. Um, so I think that was probably what the biggest change and what gave us the biggest benefit as well. Great. So, so did your customers ask you to be ISO 9001 accredited, or was it something you felt like you had to do for yourselves? Um, no, it didn't. It didn't come from customers, but we were sort of going through tenders where it was asking that question, and we always mm. said no, and it wasn't a problem. Um, so, I think it was something that I've always wanted to go through, just from a that consistency is the, the, the biggest yeah. thing I think. So, it was probably um, more so a personal thing to get that done rather than driven by customers. Yeah. Oh, great. Right. 
So that was our final question. Um, so thank you so much to the panel for, for giving us some great answers and real life examples of um, the things that your teams do. Um, I'd like to um, also thank uh, the organisers of GeodevCon. Uh, I don't know about you, but I've had a really great time and it's great to meet so many of you in person. So yeah, I'm super glad this event exists. Um, and yeah, I guess later on I'll see if anything's in the Discord and do feel free to continue the conversation there or like add your own answers or whatever. So yes, thank you so much. <laughs>